Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to give you a little test here. He- t- speak with me. Say, Isus Lubit Voss. Now turn to your neighbor and say, Isus Lubit Voss. Now y'all can try that with me. One more time. Isus L- Well, thank you for inviting me to lunch. <laughs> That actually was rushing for Jesus loves you. I promise you, if you'll go out this week and say, see who's a bit boss, you can start a conversation because people ask you, what'd you say? It will work. So there's, there's my tip. If we if you don't get anything else, use that tip this week, okay? Uh, uh, well, it's good to be here with you. Thank you for your help. And, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be heading out and abroad. If you have questions or like to know more about that, uh, see us after church and we'll give you some information. We send a prayer letter to Jamie, I think, every month. If you'd like a copy, just, Pam's got all that where we get your address and stuff. But, you know, I've been blessed to uh, be around a lot of prophecy teachers. And I was with one the other day and they was talking about the blood moons and all this stuff. And I said, no, 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 no. Uh, y'all making this way too complicated. I've got it all figured out in a little, little short thing. And, and I said, well, what's that? I said, it's like the monkey it got his tail cut off. He said, it won't be long now. So y'all remember that when you go to the zoo, and uh, I really, <laughs> when you're standing there and thinking about that. But I will tell you this, we are in the greatest revival in the history of the world without a shadow of a doubt. It is happening right now in this generation. And I think that is a, is a great thing, that we get to be a part of that. And, uh, you know, there's more lost people in the world today than ever before. So there, there we go. Uh, this morning I want to speak to you out of Judges chapter 6 on the subject of doing something, uh, of God doing something only He can do. Of God doing something only He can do. So when you found Judges chapter 6, uh, I'll ask you to stand with me. I'll kind of let me know that you are there. I'll be moving quickly, but you, you, can, you can try to follow. Last, last week, Jamie, I used uh, like 30 scriptures. And some lady come up and said, I didn't think you could preach through the whole Bible in one hour. But <laughs> So anyway, then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Median for seven years. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace, your love and your mercy. And Lord, we just pray right now that you speak uh, to our hearts. And Lord, we acknowledge again that only you can do everything. We can do nothing apart from you. So, Father, I pray you move in our lives today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we, as we look at this particular passage, and we find that Israel has always been on a roller coaster ride when they did what God told them. He blessed them. Then that blessing, they decided they didn't need any God, and they ended up having to turn back to God. Uh, same as our country and same as the world today. Uh, unfortunately, when we have everything we want, there's a tendency to ignore God. And so this is what happened with Israel. And uh, God gave them over to their enemy and for, for seven years. And they would come in, and the Bible says that they were innumerable, and they'd just take everything, their food, their sheep, their goats, and all these. And I still think my analogy is the best one I can come up with. It was like when they got through, they were like a pack of dogs that hadn't eaten in a week on a bowl of gravy. They wasn't nothing left. I mean, it cleaned them out. And so it was a bad situation. And so it, finally in verse 7 it says, So Israel was brought very low because of Median, and some of Israel cried to the Lord. You know, many, many times we wait as a last resort when everything else has not worked. I've actually had people, well, say that I could pray for you. Well, I've been to the doctor. I've done this and this. It wouldn't hurt for me to try that. I've heard that more than one time in my life. And, uh, but, you know, it, it's a last resort. I, I was sharing this morning that one of our fellows went to a, foreign country and uh, a lady there got a job in the king's palace and his mother-in-law or excuse me his his stepmother I guess it was one of the two anyway she was sick and had all the money in the world and nobody could heal her and as a last resort she allowed one of the ladies to pray for her and God immediately healed that woman on the spot and as a result of this this country that was very closed has now not only asked her to that she can bring her Bible and she can pray but if she has any friends, that they could all come and work in the palace as well because one woman was obedient to pray. So don't think God can't use you. 
And this is where Israel was. And they cried out to the Lord, so the Lord sent them a preacher. He sent them a prophet to come, and he basically said, God told you that if you turn away from him and start worshiping idols and you start worshiping Baal and you start doing all these things and you turn away from me, then my hand's not going to be with you. And they didn't listen. And this is where they was at. And because of that, that's what they were facing. Self-inflected injuries. Sin that they brought upon themselves. And the Lord tells us that many, many times if, if things are going wrong, the first thing we need to check is, is, our, own, is our own life. We're, in, uh, we're involved with another ministry that does stream white, big cities. And the first question you call when you talk to them, they said, is there a sin in your life you need to deal with? Question number one, dealing with depression, suicide, whatever it is, is there something in your life that you've got to deal with the bottom of the root? You know, I asked a friend of Jamie and I that was the prayer strategy for the state of Tennessee. Uh, one time I said, what is the prevailing sin in the state of Tennessee? What is number one in the church? And y'all can all find things running through your mind, but you know what? He looked at me, he said, without a doubt, it is apathy. That we've got everything we need, and we don't have to look to the Lord. That's our mindset. And this is where they was at. And because of that, the preacher told them clearly, this is why you're suffering. So then this is where Gideon comes into the picture. An angel comes and speaks to Gideon, and he's hiding, trying to get something to eat. And as he's trying to get something to eat there, the Lord uh, comes and the angel of the Lord speaks to him and says, You mighty man of valor. And I really do think that he probably looked around to see who he was talking to because this was a guy who was so afraid that he was hiding just to get him something to eat. But we do need to understand that God does not look at the past. God does not necessarily look at the present. God looks at the future. He knows what he can do to you and what his plans are for you. He tells us that. He told us in Jeremiah, before I formed you in the belly of the womb, I ordained you a prophet to the nation. God knows what's ahead. And he prepares this for us. And so the angel of the Lord spoke to them, and then Gideon had a good question. He said, well, if the Lord is with us, then why is all this trouble coming on us? Why are we in such suffering? And where is all the miracles that we heard about from our fathers? He says, God has abandoned us. And I want to tell you again, it was not God that had abandoned them. It was them that had abandoned God. The Lord promised, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. If God has, I, I, I love that kind of that old story that the wife looked over to the husband one time and said, you know, as I was driving down the road, said, well, honey, we used to sit close together. And he said, well, I ain't moved. Think about that just a second. Can y'all remember those days when you, <laughs> when you ride around? And uh, anyhow, I don't know where that come from. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, this is what's going on in, in Gideon's life and felt like God had forsaken them. And, and, and it said, the Lord had looked at him, go in your strength, have I not sent you? And then he starts making excuses. How many times do we do that? We need you to do this. I need help here. God gives you an opportunity. We start thinking of all the reasons we can't do it. That's a good thing. Think of all the reasons you can't do it, but then do it. Because God wants to use you to do something that you cannot do. Something that only God can do through you. That's when he gets the glory. And this is what he's telling him. And then after Gideon makes all the excuses, well, I'm from the weakest tribe. I'm the weakest one in the clan. And all these things that he starts talking about, well, God looks at him and he says, But I, the Lord, said to him, Surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midians as one man. Think about that. We were, we were in a place one time and we were getting nowhere. They were in a drought and they were starving and they were hungry. And when you're hungry and you don't have anything to eat and it ain't rained for a year, you, uh, you're in bad shape. And one of the guys with us on the trip said God spoke to me and said we need to pray for clouds by day and rain by night and I said if God said that then let's do that so we began praying and it opened up and poured within just a few minutes I mean just coming through the roof it was amazing and not only was it amazing we had clouds every day and we had rain every night for the whole time we was there God answered that prayer he spoke to them uh, Something else that went on, we were in two groups. The other group was south of us about 
two hours away. And when we get back telling their story and said, well, guess what happened to us? We had a nurse and they were saying, we need rain. And she spoke up and said, it's going to rain. And then she goes, I, I, I don't do that. I don't know where that come from. And he said, my friend said, it's from the Lord. Guess what? Rained every day in their place too. When we get a word from the Lord, if we'll be obedient, God will do amazing things. The Lord said, I will be with you. But Gideon said, I'd like to have a sign. He was from that part of the country in Missouri. He had to show me. And so he said, you wait right here, and I'm going to go get a sacrifice, and you come back. And he went, and he got the sacrifice, and he laid it on the altar, and the angel of the Lord just touched it, and poof, it went up in smoke. And he realized he was with the, Lord, the angel of the Lord, and he began to be afraid. And the Lord himself spoke to him and said, don't be afraid. Nothing's going to happen to you. God gave him that sign, and he needed that encouragement because that very night he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go tomorrow, and I want you to tear down the altar of Baal. And I want you to take those poles, those Asher poles, and I want you to use them for the firewood, and I want you to offer this sacrifice. Uh, let me tell you, a lot of things have not changed in the world. One of those pictures you saw was an altar with poles around it and flags. The idea behind those is you never touch them. If they fall down or you take them down, it's a bad omen. You've got to let them fall by themselves. That's still practice today. So to go in there and not only tear them down, but to take them up and cut them for firewood, that will ruffle some feathers, I promise you. And that's exactly what he did. He tore them down. And then the next day they ask around, Who's, who did this thing? We're going to kill him. They found out that it, was, that it was Gideon. And they told his daddy, said, bring him out here because we're going to kill him. Something you need to understand, Gideon's daddy is the one who built a thing in the first place. But now evidently the Lord had got a hold of him too. He says, no, you're not going to kill anybody. Let Baal contend for himself. If anybody contends for Baal, you're the one that will die. Cannot Baal take care of himself? If he's a God, why does he need us to do that? Isn't that a good question? If he's a God, why does he, why does he need me to do this? I shared with you the story about the rain, the particular place where we were playing, when, staying when that happened, the last day when we left. And I started paying the groups out. The, the person there at the counter took all their idols and laid them on the desk. Said, I don't want these anymore. We prayed to these and nothing happened. But you came and prayed. We got rain. I want your God. If there's no power in a God, what good is it? But here's what they said. He, he, he told them this, and, and as we went through the, the passage, and, and he said to him, Gideon, I want you to go out and, and do this, and Gideon done it. And, and God began to use him, and and he saw then when he had done these things and he had done that and he was faithful for that. See, God blesses obedience. When he made that step, God gave him another assignment. And he said, I tell you what you want you to do, Gideon. He said, I want you to blow the trumpet and I want you to summon all the men that's going to come and fight with us. And Gideon did and 32,000 people showed up to go to battle. 32,000. And it says, the Holy Spirit came upon Gideon and 32,000 people were assembled. Gideon couldn't do that. Gideon was hiding. A few days later, he was afraid himself, much less lead 32,000 people. But the Holy Spirit come on him, only something that God could do. And the people showed up for battle. And when they did, Gideon was like, wow, this is really going to happen. The people are really going to follow me because the enemy was assembling itself over uh, 135,000 of them had gathered together and they were assembling in another place and here Gideon was had all these people. And he began to say, God, wow, you're really going to do this. And so he asked for another sign. He said, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to put a fleece out and I want you to cause dew to fall on the fleece and it get wet and the ground be dry. The next morning he got up, it was wet, he rang water out and filled the bowl. Then he said, God, have patience with me. But, but when, uh, 
when you do this, I want you to uh, make the, make the uh, fleece dry and the ground wet. And he did that. God answered that sign. Now, I want you to understand something. It was not to determine God's will. God had already told him what to do. This was simply to build his faith. Um, God called me to preach through a vision. Sitting in the choir, minding my own business, and he hauled off and just slapped me in the face, knocked my teeth out. I felt to see if I had any teeth. I was bleeding. It was so real, and I wrote something down. And at that time, I was in a group, and we were writing a lot of songs, and I thought, this is something for a song. Stuck it in my pocket. I'm going to tell this quickly. Got to the place, and the pastor asked me to come over to his house, and, and uh, he said, God's asking you to preach, calling you to preach. And uh, I said, you're out of your mind. You, you're a crazy guy, and da-da-da. And I went home, and Pam says, what did he want? I said, well, he thinks I'm called to preach. He said, what do you think? I said, if God wanted me to preach, he'd have told me himself. He'd have got my attention. He would have slapped me or something and I've written in my pocket and written in my pocket was preach the gospel to the nations and feed my sheep. See some of us like Paul, you gotta have a blinding experience, but I was no different than Gideon. That night we went up there and he said Pastor was going to resign, going to do the Lord's Supper and resign. He got up there, walked up there and never said a word, says anybody here need to make a decision tonight. And I said, Lord, if you really want me to do this this send somebody up the aisle. Somebody went up. I said, Lord, if you really want me to do this, send somebody else up the aisle. Another one went up. I said, Lord, if you really want me to do this, send somebody else up the aisle. The third one went up. I was the fourth one. I had no doubt that God had put that in my heart. But I still needed a, needed a faith. I needed to build my faith for what was about to happen. And this is what Gideon done. And sometimes God will do that. And we see this in the other area. Because when they're all gathered up in verse 9... The Lord come to Gideon and he said, Gideon, if you're still afraid, if you still have some doubt, then I want you to take one of your buddies and I want you to go down to the camp and just listen to what they're saying. And so Gideon walks down there. He goes to that camp. He walks up on a person and he's telling his dream to a buddy. He said, last night I dreamed that a, a loaf of barley bread come rolling through the camp and it just flattened the camp. And his buddy said, that is nothing but Gideon and the Lord. They are going to take us away. They're going to capture every one of us. Now, what are the odds? 135,000 people, and Gideon just walks up, and there happens to be somebody telling the story to give him the confidence that he needed. See, God gives us those signs. I shared earlier this morning, we were needing something in an area where we were working, where they were illiterate and children, and we needed something for the, the programs that we do with the kids and I said we need a flip chart that goes from creation all the way through and we prayed that night on the train woke up the next morning with the directors of child evangelism sleeping under my bunk in a country of 1.6 million people God put them right there and gave us our car it's amazing what God can do and this is what he done to them he told him he said he let him hear firsthand them prophesying the enemy what was going to happen. And so here he goes. After that, he comes back. He had that dream. He had that vision. And the first thing he did was stop and he prayed. He bowed down and he worshiped the Lord. He realized that God was going to do this. You know, in, in Philippians, it tells us not to worry about anything, but pray about everything. And don't forget to thank God for his answers. For if we'll do this, we'll have God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. So here he is. He's got all these people together, and he's fixing to go out to battle, and he's thinking about it. And man, you know, here we are, and here's the deal. Uh, got all these folks together. Gideon's excited, and the Lord said, you got too many, Gideon. I want you to tell all those that's afraid to go back home. And so he went from 32,000 down to 10,000. 22,000 of them left. Now, how would that make you feel? You see why God was building his confidence and building his faith? And then he told him, he said, you still got too many. And when they went to drink, some of them got down in the river and drank with their mouth, but others took the water in their hands and they left it. He said, you take those 300 you take those 300 out, and now we're going to go out, and we're going to tackle that 135,000. 
Because if you had 32,000, the people might get it in their mind, we did this. And God was out to do something that only God could do. And so there they are, 300 against 135,000. Uh, I know some of y'all, we got younger folks in here. I know some, some of y'all play basketball. I don't know if any of y'all play football or whatever. But can you imagine huddled up and your coach is telling you, okay, we're getting ready. This is the big one. We're going to go out there. There's 135,000 of them, but we got 300. All we got to do is kill 450 each, and we can win this thing. Would you be excited about that? But then he says, no, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out there and we're going to take a clay pot and we're going to put a lamp in it. We're going to light that lamp. And we're going to take our horns. And you just do as I do. So he took a hundred and he said, you go here, you go here, and you go here. And he, so he spread those, those 300 out. And then he came out there and he broke his pot. And when he did, he broke theirs. And they blew their trumpets and they began to yell, The sword of the Lord and Gideon. I got a feeling that was a praise chorus back in those days. They just kept yelling, just kept singing who they were and it scared everybody. And they began, God turned them against each other and they started killing one another. And all they did was got to stand there and watch. They got to see something that only God could do. And God annihilated the majority of that group. But then they started running. And so they pursued him. And he called all those others back, sent word out that, hey, we need you to come help us head them off at the pass. We don't want to let any of them get away. So he called all the others back in. You see, sometimes you may not be Gideon on the front line, but God uses everybody. In Corinthians, he talks about the gifts, and I sum that up real quick to say everybody is somebody in the one body of Christ. God uses us all. He don't have pew warmers. That's not in the list of gifts. He calls us all to be involved. And so when he called them all out and he'd done that and he took off after them, he also got to a place where two of the guys, when they went in there, said, my men are hungry. We're pursuing the enemy. Can you give us something to eat? And they said, no. When you catch him, come back and we'll feed you. See, it was, they were really afraid because if they helped them and then the enemy could come back and punish them he said I'll be back but when I do I'm going to punish you and then the second time he went to the other place and when he went to the other place they said the same thing you haven't caught him yet you go catch him then we'll feed you he said when I come back I'm going to tear your tower down and God's going to punish you so he went after him and he called all those places he caught them all. He finished them all. He come back and he destroyed. The first place he came, he, the Bible says he took briars and he whipped them publicly. But the second place he went in, 70 men died because they would not help. I want to tell you, there's a lot of people in the church dead today without a shadow of a doubt because they got in God's way. Bible tells us if God be for us who can be against us but I firmly believe also if God be against us then who can be for us it is God that sustains us it is God that protects us so I'm here today to challenge you again to think about being a part of something only God can do you know where we go there's 1.6 billion people in that area of the world one out of every six people in the world live there. One out of every four lost people in the world live there. It's pretty big odds. But it's amazing what God can do. And he gets all the glory and all the honor. If we took our whole country over there, we couldn't make it, we wouldn't have enough people. But God gets all the glory and all the honor. So what's our part in that? You know, one of my guys was sharing a testimony that he was invited to a prison. And he says, you can speak to the guys, but don't you say anything about the Bible. Now, Brother Jamie, how would you like to be just offered to speak? You get to the gate, and that's the instructions you're given. Yeah, you can talk, but don't say anything about the Bible. And so what he started doing was just telling about 
to Operation Andrew about the prayers they had for people, how God healed this one, how God healed this one, how God brought rain. All he did was tell stories about what God had done. You know, that's what he says. You shall be my witness. Just tell what I've done. He did all those things, and the warden said, I want to see you in my office. He thought, what did I do? I never mentioned the Bible. I never said a thing about it. All I did was talk about the prayers. He gets in there, and the warden says, would you pray for me? And then he says, do you have a Bible with you? Could I have one? And then when he got to the gate, the guard stopped him. He thought, now what kind of trouble am I in? All the guards said, can we have a Bible too? He just told what God had done. It's only something God could do. We were driving one day in this place, and I felt led to stop at this house, and I got to this house, and here's what the lady told me. I used to be a believer, but God didn't heal my husband, so I don't believe in him no more. And I thought, God, stop me here in the middle of the road to go in there for this. Well, there was another little girl there. She couldn't hear. She couldn't speak. She was a teenager. We, we began just to take the banjo cube with the translator and share the best we could with those pictures. She couldn't pray a sinner's prayer. But when it was all done, she said, Something only God could do. Now, I know she would say, let me tell you what happened. We drove by that the place the next day. She saw the Jeep. She chased it for over a mile. Came back to the village. Stood there, smiled, worked with everybody, hugged on people all day long. Something only God could do. That's my challenge for you today. Will you ask God to let you be a part of only something you can do. Let's pray. Father, you are able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think according to your power who works in us to all generations through the church. God, you allow us to be a witness to see your mighty hand. And God, you're doing just as many miracles today as you did in the old days. And Lord, sometimes we have not because we ask not. And so Lord, today, whose ever heart you speak to, whatever it is you do, to allow them to be something great. Only because of you, though, Lord. Only to be a part of something that you can do. Lord, we just pray as Gideon was obedient to the Holy Spirit, so will we be. And Father, I ask this in your name. give you an opportunity this morning how long has it been since you've seen God do something that only he can do do you remember do you remember a time when God did something in your life that only he can do he's pretty amazing Amen. I've seen him do things that I just, just stood in awe One of the biggest things he ever did was when he came here. And that's something that only he could do. And I couldn't do it myself. And this morning, whatever your need may be, it may be that you may be lost. You may know it. It may just be that you're, you've moved. God's still sitting there, but you have moved. Maybe it's time to work your way back. Maybe somebody in your family. Maybe a neighbor, a friend that you know that you just want to pray for. It's time to do that. 
see a praying person, a praying group of people is powerful because there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in prayer. So this morning, right here, right now, would you come? It's not about anybody but you and him. Would you take an opportunity to just say, Lord, I, I need you. I want to see you move. Would you be willing and you have courage enough just to step out?